The Templin Institute is creating an original universe. What you're about to see is the second of three ideas we have of what that universe might look like. But only one can be developed into a fully-fledged setting. Tomorrow, October 6th, once the final video showcasing the last of these worlds has been released, you'll get the chance to cast your vote right here on YouTube. Until then, though, two things to remember. We are right at the start of this process, so think of what you're about to see as a really rough roadmap rather than anything definitive. And while eventually we hope to commission some artwork of our world the way we imagine it, in the meantime we're truly honored to showcase the work of various artists who donate their portfolios. It doesn't always perfectly match our vision, but it should give you a sense of what we're going for at the very least. And if you like what you see, you'll find links to those galleries in the description. The history of mankind does not begin in the works of their own scholars. It is found instead within the ancient documents of the Elderkin, those races that bestrode the world from the earliest days of the Second Age. In the esteemed archives of the Dwarves, Elves, and others, the journals of naturalists can be found, and their vivid descriptions of the primitive race of men offer an unparalleled glimpse into the earliest chapters of their early existence. It is clear that few among the Elderkin held any special regard for early humanity. As a species, little was found to mark it as anything other than a savage pest. Mankind was judged to lack the higher graces or innate wisdom that marked those of greater potential. Even compared to the lesser races, the orcs, and other things that possessed at least some primal cunning, human beings seemed to lack any inherent nobility or unique potential. They were seen, at best, as crude imitations of the Elderkin, and at worst, hardly any different than orcs themselves. Neither the elves nor dwarves or any other civilized race expected mankind to be anything other than scattered chiefdoms or barbarous nomads. So when the first human states and kingdoms sprouted up across the world, the Elderkin were taken slightly by surprise. Yet so paltry were the achievements of the human race in the shadow of the Elderkin, and their spread so confined, that rather than challenging any preconceived notions of their potential, the early rise of humanity went largely unnoticed. Slowly and arduously across the millennia, mankind earned a place for itself as civilized people with a destiny of their own. But where the empires of the Elder Races seemed to weather the passing of time with an unyielding constancy, the domains of men rose and fell in an endless cycle of fleeting glory and lasting ruin. Orcs and other things destroyed countless human kingdoms, but more often than not, it was betrayals, wars, and other self-inflicted catastrophes that snuffed out the fire of the human race. Mankind's kings and statesmen of this era were vassals of the Elderkin, trade partners, or even allies, but never equals. The presence of a human nation in the territory of the Elder Races might have been begrudgingly tolerated, or even celebrated as a mutually beneficial relationship, but the moment its ambitions crossed paths with the desires of their superiors, mankind was reminded of their subordinate role, often firmly. Human nations whose aspirations outstripped their station were as ruthlessly destroyed as any incursion from the lesser races might have been. In the great events that shaped the passage of the Second Age, the nations of men rarely played a meaningful role. When the Ninth Gate was found and opened, and the world seemed poised to slip eternally into the darkness, no human champions were ever named among those that fought the legions back. As the Orcish Wars engulfed the whole of the Red Steppes, and Tarangar itself, greatest of man's nations, was besieged, it was the arrival of the Elves that secured the victory, and the price in human lives was overlooked. And in the few moments when the character of humanity was truly tested, it always failed. Few traits unite those who have waged war against all that is good in the world, but every Dark Lord or Prince, every would-be God of Darkness, all have found willing servants in mortal men. It is for this reason 
that human beings have often made convenient scapegoats. The Elderkin are hardly without their own inner turmoils, and more than once, a human kingdom has been blamed for all the ills and strife in their societies. Crumbling ruins are all that remain of the human kingdoms that once filled the Emerald Sea, extinguished for no other reason than elvish pride. For the Republic of Voscardia, this spectre of annihilation had been a recurring shadow throughout all their history. Nestled between the great empires of the Northern Seas, in the aftermath of the Orcish Wars, it had come to control an increasingly vital waterway. It was a modest human nation and made a convenient buffer state for the elder races of the region. Its position gave it wealth and power, but not enough to push back against the machinations of its neighbors. Whenever war came to the Northern Seas, Vosgard would inevitably fall, unable to withstand the overwhelming power of the nations that surrounded it. Often, it was used as a bargaining chip, traded back and forth as a vassal, protectorate, or tributary. The nomenclature differed, but the outcome was always the same. In the final century of the Second Age, Vosgardia seemed poised to once again face the all-too-familiar cycle of uncertainty and subjugation. Nominally a vassal of the Tassendral Empire, it had enjoyed an unusual era of self-determination and prospered as a result. While the elven nobility of Tassendral were distracted by internal politics driven by questions of succession, the Republic of Voscardia had been transformed. The city itself had doubled and then tripled in size, while its farmlands and territories extended further and further across the coasts and into the continent. For the first time in history, the inferiority of the Vosgardian state compared to some of the smaller elven kingdoms across the northern seas was not a guarantee. This in itself would likely have been enough to draw the ire of the Tassendral Empire. Though powerful human states existed, they were rare, and certain members of the Elderkin saw them as an imbalance in the natural hierarchy of civilization, an unchecked vine that needed to be trimmed. This was the belief held by Emperor Thalianar, and with his own legitimacy in doubt, he was eager for a brief one-sided war to solidify his grip on power. Yet there were also increasingly fantastical rumors flowing out of Vosgard's ports and markets. Most seemed more perplexing than revelatory, but every detail that flooded out of the city was sorted directly into the ears of Tassendral's spymasters. The unprecedented success of the city was said to have been manifested by a new kind of sorcery. Human beings were universally feeble in the practice of the higher arts, but as Vosgardia prospered, everything from its architecture to the local weather began to change. Its skies grew dark, its people weary. It had become like no other nation in the world, and the Empire's appetites for a confrontation grew. Emperor Thalianar got his wish in the 2000th, 914th year in the old calendar, year zero by the new. Presented with terms they had no choice but to reject, Vosgardia asked to negotiate, and Tassendral responded with war. As had been repeated again and again throughout the history of the Northern Seas, elven armies marched across the Santa Plains and prepared to cross the River Vosk. Tiergard Crossing was the most natural point in which to block the enemy, but in all the attempts made across all the centuries, no human force had ever won a victory there. When the Vosgardian army assembled across the river, they faced the same ancient swordsmen, the same grizzled, steely faces that had personally cut down their fathers, grandfathers, and more distant ancestors. Elven mages had anticipated some great display of power and prepared the appropriate counterspells. But as the inevitable confrontation at the River Vosk grew imminent, no sorcery arose to block their way. Human innovation was not often valued highly by the great artisans of the Elderkin. 
it was considered crude and unrefined by the standards of the elves, and borderline irresponsible to the dwarves. Yet every now and then, despite every disadvantage, it was capable of producing something new. And in Vosgardia, it created a miracle. Inspired by the discarded works of the dwarves, a cabal of engineers had crafted a crude device, one that used steam to push a piston back and forth. From this initial secret invention had eventually come many others, and on the banks of the River Vosk, the first of them would be revealed. It was called the MG-12 Recoil-Operated Machine Gun. It took an alliance of five elven emperors and three dwarven high kings to wipe Voskardia off the face of the world. But for almost two decades, the northern coast became a battleground without precedent, in which a single, isolated human kingdom endured the assembled wrath of the Elderkin. There was little glory on these battlefields, only pockmarked craters, shattered trees, and the screams of the dying. It was a harbinger of things to come. The idea that these new technologies might somehow be contained was never realistic. So distracted by their own internal rivalries, the rapid advancement of human civilization had been almost entirely overlooked. The developments in Vosgardia were soon repeated elsewhere, and then everywhere. The time of the Elderkin was over. The era of man had begun. In the depths of ancient mountains, and in the heart of the oldest forests, the world as it existed in the Second Age can still be found. There are places where the old dance between magic and nature continues, secluded pockets where time stands still. But such places grow smaller every year. The world, this new one that mankind has named Tyrell, is one of industry, progress, and relentless ambition and it will not stop until it has achieved the total destruction of the old. In every city, smokestacks punctuate the horizon, smothering the skies in blankets of ash and grime until the rain burns as it falls. The incessant hum and clang of machinery reverberates over the modern age, while armies of men, dwarves, and elves alike assemble in ragged lines. They march into the factories, into the textile mills, the coal mines, and the steel foundries, the lifeblood and gristle of the new, perpetual machine. Every year, the mechanisms of production and slaughter are refined. Every year, the soil of Tyrell is covered in more shells and drenched in more blood. There are creatures that thrive in a world like this, Ancient things the old races drove away, in times all but forgotten. They are returning now, and the world that man has made is very much to their liking. The gates will be uncovered soon, and the harvest can begin. So that was the world of Tyrell, and when it comes to the fantasy genre, I think I'm what you'd call a casual fan. I love all the tropes and whatnot, but when I think of the worlds I'm really invested in, there's really only two or three. And where I think the genre tends to lose me a bit is in the vaguely European medieval setting that most seem to have. Sometimes it's great, Westeros is awesome, but I just feel like I've seen that a million times before. The World War I era, by contrast, is something I think that could work really well, not to be confused with steampunk, by the way. And I say that because fantasy is all about the escape from the modern world. Hey, that might be why they call it fantasy. But industrialization is always painted as the bad guy. And in World War I, you really saw that kind of take over the world and the death of the old one. So I think there's an interesting intermingling of theme on this one, with fantasy escapism being destroyed by the mechanized world. Not to mention that the trenches of World War I, all that stuff that inspired Mordor, seems like it would fit very well into a dark, low fantasy setting. Like, if you're a vampire on the Western Front in 1914, is that like a great deal for you? Or are you freaking out because everyone's carrying white phosphorus grenades and there's phosphorus in the sun, so... Those are the kind of questions I want to tackle with this world. How do you bring in all the fantasy cliches into the World War I era? 
I'm not super familiar with the fantasy genre, but I am cheating a bit by bringing in that World War I setting, so in terms of difficulty, this world probably sits at a medium. And with that said, I hope you've enjoyed it, and I'll see you tomorrow for the final video and the vote.